I'd like to give a teaching now that I've been anticipating on the importance of our vows and specifically in relation to the ten vows of Kuan Yin that we have in our Kuan Yin's Rosary of Mercy. You may desire to take out this booklet now and have it before you because I'll be referring to each of these vows as they are elucidated in this ritual, presented in a very beautiful way. You can also turn to 9.005 Kuan Yin's Ten Vows, for these are the same ones that are in this beautiful ritual. What is a vow? Well, a vow is an investment of ourselves in the work of God. It is the virya of the word flowing through that work. When we value the Word, the Christ, the Logos, then we desire to take part in the mission that is before us. Each of us has a sacred mission. And when we set our hand to the plow, our feet upon the path, our eyes upon the divine gaze, we set in motion through our vows the victory sense of life that helps us to win. We put on the vestments of the Lord and we enter into the wonderful world of his wisdom. We value the wine of the Spirit in this. And the volume of our own ability to wow the universe in this vow experience suffuses itself through our being. We are lifted up through our vows, and the sail is set for our journey, which is a sacred journey of light. When we give these Kuan Yin vows, these ten beautiful vows, virtue is one within us. Because we acclaim God as the source of all, we acclaim and affirm and aver through the words that we speak again and again that we are not the doer, God in us is the active principle and all manner of sacred occurrences may manifest because we have let go and allowed through the giving of this vow 
the authority of the Divine One to be manifest through our voice. So really the vow is the voice of the word that allows the virya of that wine of the spirit to flow through us. The first Kuan Yin vow, in deepest reverence to the sacred name of Quan Shir Yin, I am embodying the teachings of the Buddha. To be a true disciple and one who can aver and avow the truth, we must know the teachings. By knowing them, we embody them. We have purposely put within these vows the name of God as I am capitalized for we are affirming that God is present within us and within the manifestation in the now of the vow. I am embodying the teachings of the Buddha. First, I know those teachings. I have studied them. I have assimilated them. I have become them. And I am continuing to embody them through the Buddha body Nirmanakaya, within myself. The Buddha is embodying the teachings through me. The Buddha is embodied within me. His teaching has become me. I have become him by embodying the teachings. And the him is the Buddhic essence of beingness, principles of light that we manifest through our conscious awareness of presence. To embody the teachings is the great joy of the Buddha for his disciples. When each one fully embodies the teaching, they get it. And the Buddha is happy and smiles because that is his goal for every disciple to become the teaching in their own way, with the fullness of their own divine individuality, where they have raised the personality into the divine atom of being and understand the nature of life through their own experience. The teaching becomes real in their lives as they realize the truth, the intrinsic nature of God within those teachings that the Buddha has embodied and, there can, and therefore can speak forthrightly of those teachings. When the disciple becomes a teaching, then the disciple can become a teacher likewise. Until that disciple has embodied the teaching, if he or she attempts to speak of the teaching, it will be from like a third party voice. When you embody the teaching, you become the voice of that teaching in the first person. You speak with the authority of your experience and the divine emanations of light as the power of the Holy Spirit flow through your voice and people feel the integrity of what you say because they know it comes from a point of presence and power. The second vow, in deepest reverence to the sacred name of Quan Shir Yin, I am swiftly attaining the wisdom of inner vision. We may have inner vision 
And yet do we have the wisdom of what that inner vision is beholding within all life and within us? There are clairvoyants who may not be great interpreters of what they see. A true clairvoyant knows through gnosis what is being observed, feels the impressions upon his or her being and soul and the delicate fabric of the auric field. And then through the proper interpretation can assist life because that inner vision is clothed with love, cherishment of souls, and an understanding of what people are going through. To be a bodhisattva, one must be compassionate. And so the wisdom of inner vision gives you the capacity to be compassionate because you see clearly, know what is acting in people's worlds, you can give them the benefit of the truth even as you hold that immaculate conception of them in light. Now swiftly attaining this wisdom is the work of the disciples who are fleet-footed and who desire that attainment only to glorify God through their works. The path becomes swifter for those who do the will of God and who use their inner vision for the holy purposes of God. When we seek wisdom rather than riches, we are illumined. And then every decision that we make is powered by that sure Holy Spirit knowledge that puts all into proper perspective, that allows us to make right choices for ourselves and for our loved ones, and that blesses everything by the purity of that inner vision. The third vow, in deepest reverence to the sacred name of Guan Shiyin, I am quickly ferrying all beings to the shore of liberation. This may seem like quite a vow, and one must have a very large ferry or raft or boat or a vessel to ferry all beings. Well, God within us is capable of miracles. And when we become the conductor, the director, the captain of this ferry or boat or ship, we see from a perspective that many others may not see the goal. We have our charts, our maps, or our navigation device, computerized or otherwise, in our hands, at our disposal, and we can navigate through the sea of samsara, around obstacles, above those issues and problems, through the equanimity of our hearts, and because of that vision that we've developed in the second vow, we know how to secure that goal for many. Really the captain of this ferry is the teacher, is the one who leads by example, by love. He is a true Pied Piper like Krishna whose divine music is heard and the soul follows.
to the pure land of the Buddhas. Now note that we ferry or quickly lead souls to the shore of liberation. Yet ultimately it will be up to the soul of those whom we lead once they reach the shore to make the trek to the summit of being. And so we can't do everything for everyone. We do our best. We lead by example. We love. We empower. We coach. At times we may cajole. We train. We give of ourselves. And yet inherent within this vow is the understanding that the shore is not one's final destiny. There is much to partake of on the island of light in the heaven world to reach that summit where the jewel resides in the lotus of the heart. The fourth vow, in deepest reverence to the sacred name of Guan Shiyin, I am obtaining good expedient means to enlightenment. There is not only one way to enlightenment. There are many paths that can be traversed. There are some that are swifter and more expedient. If we obtain those good and expedient means to enlightenment, we have the wherewithal, the tools, the spiritual techniques, to secure that state of beingness that is enlightenment. So in this vow, we're not there fully in the enlightened state. We are working through life, through our sacred labor, through our sacred labor to obtain those means. It's a process of becoming. If we were already there, Fully, we would not be living in a human body except for some who have re-embodied as avatars to assist life. These means, expedient means, are essential on our path. There are some paths that wind around and divert us from our goal. Others are swift and sure, and so we must test various processes and means and techniques to see what works for us. For some it may be meditation, where they go within to the highest state of beingness. For others, devotion gets them there more swiftly. For some, enlightened service for some decrees and prayers and spoken mantras and bhajans seem to provide us the means to have the wherewithal to fulfill our mission. And for many of us, all of these at times are used in various circumstances in order to give us what we require. I believe our movement is one which offers some of the highest means, the most expedient means to enlightenment. And therefore, we provide them with good cheer, good will, and with the authenticity of the brotherhood who have used these techniques for eons of time to secure the victory of life streams in their ascension and in their union with God. The fifth vow, in deepest reverence to the sacred name of Quan Shiyin, I am swiftly boarding the boat of transcendental wisdom. 
Now why is this one coming after the one where we are fearing all beings? It's a question for us to consider. This may be a higher boat. Transcendental wisdom that transcends the human dimension and plane. At this point, the one who vows with Kuan Yin at the midpoint, the fifth vow of the ten, enters into the path with an intensity of God desire to free souls. And the boat that is boarded is the divine ship of Maitreya, the path of initiation, whereby one is fully returned to the source and becomes all through love, through charity, through givingness. When we swiftly board, there must be an urgency of the captain for us to take flight or to leave the dock. And so this harks of the necessities of life to keep one's eye on the goal, one's vision clear and pure, and the stream of one's consciousness focused on the allness of the divine in order for us to secure these souls that we are vowing to save. The sixth vow, in deepest reverence to the sacred name of Quan Shiyin, I am transcending the sea of karmic suffering. In order to fully serve and save others, one must master the emotional or astral plane of one's own being and transcend that sea of one's own karma and the suffering that is attached to that karma. What karma is, is attachment to the human, plane and dimension. And there is always, at some level, a type of suffering that manifests through that attachment. Emotional suffering, physical suffering, mental anguish. When we let go and we transcend the sea, we rise above the sea, we float over that samsaric sea of non-beingness and illusion, then we have the wherewithal through our own self-mastery to relieve the suffering of others. If we have not mastered our own emotional bodies, how can we fully assist others who may be going through intense initiations, pain, travail, anguish, sorrow. We have the cosmic equipoise within our being and the mastery of the water element in our lives to support everyone in the highest way. We know exactly what to say, when, by the power of the Holy Spirit, to guide gently, graciously, the bereaved and those who are dealing with themselves at deeper and deeper levels of their subconscious. In this sixth vow, we have passed the six o'clock line we are in the emotional plane or quadrant of our lives on our path. We are choosing with the Divine Mother to alleviate this suffering by first transmuting within our being every emotional attachment to unreality.
the seventh vow in deepest reverence to the sacred name of Quan Shiyin, I am quickly internalizing higher principles, the consciousness of formless awareness, and the way of the Buddha. Now, just as in the first vow, we embody the teachings here, we have internalized the higher principles of the Buddha and the Buddhic way, the formless awareness, that void state of beingness where co-creation takes place. And we walk in the Tao, the way of the Buddha. By internalizing all this, we apply it systematically, daily within our lives, by God's grace, through action, through work, through sacred labor. We are involved through our involution in the affairs of God, even as we evolve through the evolution of consciousness into the state of formless awareness and perfect presence where the Buddha manifests the allness of presence. The eighth vow in deepest reverence to the sacred name of Quan Shiyin, I am climbing the mountain of ultimate enlightenment. There are stages of enlightenment that we all go through. Processes of awakening upon our path. Our goal is to reach the summit of being where we are fully awake. We need sleep no more. The enlightenment is all about us. The light shines in our auric field through our crown, and there is no night there, as it says in Revelation, where the sun shines 24-7 in our consciousness. And as the sun is shining, there is no longer any need for sleep, slumber, or rejuvenation that comes during that sleep because we are living in a complete state of total awareness, total recall of God in that beingness mode. So in this vow, we are climbing that mountain, and as we climb, we secure for others with our ropes and picks, crampons, with our nails driven into the side of the mountain, and the carabiners there to support the weight of others who are yet below us. Those lifelines to the presence for them to reach their enlightened state. And the ninth vow, in deepest reverence to the sacred name of Quan Shiyin, I am abiding in a state of non-duality. This is the penultimate or second to the final vow where we have reached that state of non-dualism, of unity, of beingness and presence, of oneness in God's eternal light. And we abide there with the permanency of spirit, with the blessedness of God's grace manifesting through our awareness. In this non-dual state, we enter the zero point of being. We feel with the eternal spirit 
all life as a cosmic hush manifesting and wafting through our being and all around us. We know the intimations of every soul because we are one with every soul. And we can instantaneously offer a part of ourselves in that non-dual unified state to assist life through our bodhisattva vows. Like Jesus, when one comes with faith and simply touches the garment of our being, life energy, healing, love flows from us to support that one, to bring wholeness and a return to a state of perfection and beauty. And finally, in the tenth vow, in deepest reverence to the sacred name of Guan Shiyin, I am uniting with the body of all essence. Call this God, the creator, life, divine intelligence, love, the source, whatever you desire. The body of all essence is the ultimate destiny of all of us. By going within and securing through love the state of listening, beingness, and perfect presence. I am uniting with the body of all essence somewhat of a dichotomy to say body and essence in the same phrase and yet this is the Buddha body the Buddha essence to unite with it is to understand it to love and cherish it to feel comfortable enough in merging with it that we let go of our human selfhood completely. We slip into this divine void state of expressionless joy, perfect happiness, divine bliss, nirvana, This uniting process happens day by day and in little inklings of our eternality and our godhood as we abide in presence or as one Buddhic teacher shared with us at a Meru course as we rest in presence. This is the restful state of picture perfect presence. There is no longer struggle, striving, bane, or the subjective nature of life manifesting in our world. We have become God like. We have blended everything of ourselves with the one. As we incorporate these ten vows in our path of bodhisattva-hood, of Buddha-hood, the vow becomes activated in a new and powerful way, each time we say it, say them, in order to secure first within us our divinity and then to emanate light to assist souls everywhere in fulfilling their purpose and truing their being to their eternal state of Godhood.
Yes, there is a type of striving in the vow because that virya is there working through the vow as that voice of the word within us. When we continue to verbalize and voice through our vows this word of God, who we are, we become, we come into being, we are the I am, we manifest God within us. I pray that as we give these vows within our Kuan Yin's rosary or any time we choose, that we enter a new state of divine beingness in order to fully assist our holy brothers and sisters everywhere upon earth in realizing their oneness with us and with Source. Maitreya, I believe, said that this ritual of the Kuan Yin's rosary is the most powerful means of spreading compassion across our earth, kindness, forgiveness, and mercy that is available to us. When we understand these vows, when we embody them, and not just simply sing them or mouth them mindlessly, but with great intention and understanding, then the power of mercy is there. The action of light manifests through us. Souls are one in oneness. And we, through enlightened self-interest, also are blessed and graced with this mercy flame. Thank you for listening and participating as I've, by God's grace, been allowed to share this teaching today. I think it's in divine order that we go a little over today and give now the Kuan Yin's Rosary in closing our service so that we can fully incorporate what we've heard in this beautiful ritual anew now.